good evening to you and happy new year east africa it is good to see you this year uh, 2017 trust that you're on to a good start to 2017 many thanks for joining us this evening on bottom line east africa the show that brings you comprehensive news from across the region and i hope that you are on to a good start many thanks for joining us let's begin this show tonight uh, with the edition of bottom line east africa in 2017 with new from Uganda where members of parliament from Kasese region have petitioned the International Criminal Court to investigate the recent raid on the palace of Rwenzururu King Charles Wesley Mumbere that left up to 100 people dead. The MPs one president Yoweri Museveni investigated for reportedly ordering the attack on the palace. Also cited for investigations include Brigadier Peter Elwelu, the second division commander of the Uganda's People's Defense Forces, and Asuman Mugienyi, who is the assistant inspector general of Uganda Police Force that arrested the Rwenzururu King. Here is that report from our partner station, NBS Uganda. Last month, a team of members of parliament from Kasese petitioned the International Criminal Court against killings that occurred in Kasese, in which several Renzuru Kingdom Royal Guards were killed and scores more were arrested, including the home singer Charles Wesley Mumbili. The petition was buttressed by several signatures collected from residents of Kasese district. In the petition, the legislators urged the International Court to pro President Yoweri Museveni, Brigadier Peter Luelu, the second division commander, and who oversaw the operation, and the police director in charge of operations, Asman Mujeni, as the people culpable for what they referred to as dreadful acts in Kasese. The petition cited crimes which include violation of human rights and crimes against humanity. We consider the crimes against the people of Renzori in part as genocide. You will see those murders. You were there as members of the media. The world saw what happened. Indiscriminate killing of children, women, men, to the extent that even women were undressed. Dehumanizing women, dehumanizing men, dehumanizing humanity. There is hope that the ICC will probe the latest episode in the long-running Kasese equation as per the Rome Statute that Uganda is a signatory to. Please note that this acknowledgement letter does not mean an investigation has been opened. Know that an investigation will be opened by the office of the prosecutor. The implication of this is that it is entirely in their hands. Even if we wanted to withdraw or do anything, it is in their hands. So the assurance is not to us, they are now working on behalf of the people who are murdered, on behalf of justice to Ugandans. The petitioners sounded a warning to any other officers to be mindful of the implications of their acts. But our brothers in uniform, when you are sent out there, use your brains. Some of them sometimes when they are on missions, they tend to work as if they left their brains under their beds. Order from above. Just know that even with orders from above, you will be dealt with individually. You can have freedom to choose your reckless actions, but you will never get the same freedom to choose the consequences of your reckless actions. And this is what, really, this is just the basis for all this, that you are reckless with human life, and we as citizens, we hold the value system that every life must count. The MPs believe that ICC was the last resort since the Constitutional Court outlawed persecution of a ruling president. That the Ugandan courts cannot prosecute a president who has committed acts of genocide. And it is for those reasons that resort has to be made to the Rome Statute itself, which does not provide for immunity against crimes against... It is not clear how President Museveni, who has of recent turned a vocal critique of the court and his government, will respond to any probe by the court. This is if the Hague-based court finds merit in the petition. The petitioners include leader of opposition Winnie Kiza, William Nzogu of Busongura North, Robert Centenary of Kasese Municipality, Atkins Katushabi of Bukonzo West, Harold Muhindo of Bukonzo East, and one Sunday Apollo. 
And to put this matter in perspective, our special correspondent from Uganda, Solomon Serwanja, interviewed lawyer Fred Mwema. Listen in. President Jerome Seveni finally taken to the International Criminal Court. A case has been lodged. What next? Well, what needs to be known here is that uh, the step that has been taken uh, lodging a complaint to the ICC prosecutor is just a preliminary step. A lot has got to be done for the case to face its day in court. The prosecutor has got to evaluate the documents, the information that has been received uh, to see whether the information discloses the offences within the jurisdiction of the court, mm -hmm. which is uh, war crimes, crimes of aggression, uh, crimes against humanity and genocide. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have not seen the complaint lodged, but I would imagine that uh, it would fall in the ambits of uh, a genocide. Uh, the systematic attacks and widespread uh, killing of civilians, uh, which was quite unfortunate. So the procedure is that the investigator has got to form an opinion, has got to make an assessment to see whether the information uh, gives reasonable ground for an investigation to be opened. Now, it's not the prosecutor who makes the decision for the investigation to commence. The prosecutor then has got to make an application, a request to the pre-trial chamber. Uh, which constitutes of three judges to, of the court to make an order for an investigation to be commenced. So it's still early days uh, to, to make a determination as to whether or not actually a case has been admitted uh, to the court or not. We must also know that uh, the perpetrators, the alleged perpetrators of this crime are state actors. Uh, are elements within the, the state. So there is a challenge there uh, in terms of the cooperation of, of the Uganda government, in terms of handing over uh, the culprits or even assisting in the investigation. In fact, under the rules of the ICC court, the government can object to the admissibility of, of the case or even the investigation uh, if it claims that uh, it is going to carry out or is carrying out its own investigation or in fact has brought charges against these people and so on, which actually is not what we are seeing. But the major ground for uh, instituting of the investigations is if there is a reasonable cause that the offences have been committed, but also the people complaining, uh, in this case the opposition, must show that the state is unwilling to... to do these investigations or to bring the culprits to book. So in my view, the members of the opposition, the complainants, have uh, employed the available uh, international legal framework uh, which exists, uh, and this is the ICC uh, jurisdiction, where any person can report a case where you say genocide or crimes against humanity and so on have been committed within any uh, state party. It must be noted that Uganda was one of the first countries to ratify the Rome okay. Statute. So they, we are members of the Rome Statute. But we also know that uh, even if a country is not a member of the Rome Statute, for example, Sudan, for the Darfur killings, uh, the war crimes, still you have situations where the Security Council can come in and make recommendations investigations oh, yeah and i think this is where we need to come in here yeah. so the two options are the icc could be interested in the case and therefore start investigations after the pre-trial chamber thinks there's a case anyway to answer to the other option is they could dis dismiss it well not that way like i have explained what fatua can do the the, the prosecutor she will form an opinion as to whether there is reasonable ground to ask the chamber for the, an investigation to be commenced. Because basing on the evidence that has been provided. Basing on the evidence. But you must also know that it is possible if there is insufficient information, it is possible for the prosecutor to ask for more information. The prosecutor can ask for oral or written testimony. In fact, at some stage, victims' representatives can even come and make representations to the prosecutor or to the chamber so that the, there is a, a substantial uh, information, there is substantial ground on which the, the, the court can proceed. Let's also put this in perspective. I mean, this is not the first time. If 
the ICC to take up the matter. Uh -huh. It will be, it's not going to be the first time that the ICC can uh, prosecute a sitting head of state. Uhuru Kenyatta has been before the ICC until when there was not enough evidence to, uh -huh. to support the case and the uh -huh. case failed until further notice. Uh -huh. What perhaps does this mean for President Museveni if the ICC is to take up the matter? First of all, under the Rome Statute to which Uganda is a signatory in Article 25 onwards and up to 27, you are not exempted from criminal liability because you're head of state or because you're a government official. Even commanders are not exempted from criminal liability. The same statute says even those following orders of superiors in the army or the police are not exempted. So there is no prize for, for, for talking about that really. But the practicability. Yeah. What is the practicability of prosecuting a head of state? Until now, we have not had a successful prosecution of a head of state. The case of uh, Bashir uh, comes into play. We have arrest warrants. Uh, in that case, I think only one person has been arrested. We don't have a trial as yet, but Bashir is hoping uh, all over the place. Apart from South Africa, uh, Zambia, and Burundi, and a few countries which have threatened to, to arrest him and hand him over. In effect, it just remains on paper. It's, it's just an arrest warrant. But, but um, I think it is worth it to say that there is a supporting legal framework for prosecution of anybody, including a head of state, if they are found to be responsible for the commission of certain crimes. And under the Rome Statute, the person who directs or supervisors, or the person who is supposed to have prevented the commission of the crime is also held liable. Uh, so uh, Our time is fast spent, but maybe uh, uh, in one or two minutes, please uh, put, put for us in perspective. President Jeremy Seveni has been against the International Criminal Court. He called them a bunch of useless people. He's been uh, in, in Kenya at Uhuru swearing in on different occasions, and he has really demeaned the International Criminal Court. He has led the campaign at the African Union Summit for African states to pull out of the Rome Statute, and yet he finds himself as one of a possible case at the ICC. Does this mean that Uganda could actually quicken the process of withdrawing from the Rome Statute? But that's an irony, because Uganda is one of the few countries in the world that have referred cases to the ICC, the case of uh, the yeah. LRA, yeah. Ongwen. It is actually being prosecuted. You saw recently the prosecutor here to try and talk to the victims and so on. Now, this is politics. Uh, just like the U.S. has not signed the treaty for the Rome Statute, but is pushing the Rome Statute to include terrorism because of its war against terror to see that they can use the ISIS to fight the terrorists. So I think this is just politics. Uh, I don't know that uh, the Uganda government will fall through on the threat to withdraw from the ICC when they are still needing the ICC to prosecute the perpetrators of the LRA atrocities and they are still looking for reparations for the victims and so on. So I think that is basically politics. But we must know that there is that unending issue. The African governments, the African Union think that this is a court that is only looking out for African issues and African presidents and so on, because until now you don't have anybody from the West or other countries being persecuted. So that is debatable, but I think it is significant, it is symbolic that a case has been brought in respect of the loss of life in Kasese. Any loss of life should be condemned. And I think we need to wait and see what the office of the prosecutor is going to do. And it's significant that the prosecutor is an African, because before we had Ocampo and people were thinking this is a Muzungu thing, but we now have an African. Let's see what Fatou can do. Fred Mohema, many thanks for sharing your views with us this morning. Thank you. Well, many thanks for that perspective, Solomon Serwanja. Let's cross over to Congo now. And uh, the United Nations Security Council has welcomed an agreement between political parties in the Democratic Republic of Congo that seeks to ensure the first peaceful transfer of power since 1960. Negotiate, negotiators led by Congo's Catholic Bishops' Conference spent weeks in tense talks before an agreement was reached. Congolese President Joseph Kabila will step down after elections to 
be held by the end of 2017 under the last minute struck political parties of December 31st. The statement was read to the council by Council President Ambassador Olof Skog of Sweden. Under the deal, Kabila will be unable to change the constitution to allow him to stay in power for a third term. The parties agreed that Kabila will appoint a prime minister from the country, country's main opposition bloc to oversee the transition, a major sticking point in the final stages of the talks. Neither Kabila nor the country's leading opposition leader, Etienne Tshisekedi, are expected to sign the deal, raising concerns whether it will be respected. The, Conseil de Sécurité. the Security Council welcomes the signing of the comprehensive and inclusive political agreement in Kinshasa on 31st December 2016, which follows the political agreement reached on 18th December 2016 under the auspices of the African Union facilitation and commenced the tireless efforts by the conference Episcopal mediators to facilitate the agreement. The Security Council hopes for a swift implementation of the agreement in good faith and in all its in accordance with the Congolese constitution in line with the United Nations Security Council resolution 2277 in order to organize peaceful, credible, inclusive and timely presidential, national and provincial legislative elections not later than December 2017 leading to a peaceful transfer of power. National de Congo pour faciliter. Now, city authorities in Rwanda have issued a three-month ultimatum to businesses and non-governmental organizations operating offices from residential buildings to relocate to commercial buildings. The move is good news to investors in commercial properties who have always complained of low levels of office occupancy. KTN's Kigali based reporter Eugene Anangwe now joins us by way of phone for more on this and other news from Rwanda. And good evening to you, Eugene. Perhaps you can tell us what exactly is this move aimed to achieve? Sharon, uh, good evening to you and happy Furahi Day. Definitely uh, going into this particular uh, directive, you know, the city officials have said that uh, this directive was actually issued uh, long ago, like five years ago, and uh, they were now just moving uh, to effect it. And they were giving three months to those who usually operate uh, from, you know, homes instead of operating from commercial uh, buildings. And they say that the move is actually aim, aiming at uh, promoting efficient and secure, plus, of course, hygienic working environment. Because as we speak today, we have hotels that have been operating from, you know, buildings that were initially constructed as houses. You can imagine a three-bedroomed house with uh, one kitchen and, and probably two toilets uh, being used for, you know, uh, taking in uh, visitors or guests coming in to eat uh, from that particular place. And so the city authorities believe that it is time to move these people to commercial buildings. And, of course, there were complaints earlier on by some of these business people that uh, the buildings, uh, you know, suitable to have them put up some of these um, uh, facilities were not available. But today, city authorities say that uh, those buildings are now there, we have high-rise buildings that have been uh, constructed just a few uh, months ago. Some are still being constructed. And so uh, the facilities are available. So they want these people to move uh, their businesses to these particular uh, premises. Sure. Right. And I understand that this move is in line with a master plan, what is being referred to as the city master plan in Kigali. Perhaps you could give us a bit more details about this. What does this plan exactly entail? Sharon, the city master plan actually, you know, has been in place for, 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 for quite, uh, you know, quite some time. And it has some very clear zoning guidelines that usually show or are actually showing how uh, particular areas uh, will be utilized. We have areas specifically designated as commercial areas. We have areas specifically designated as residential or dual purpose areas and the kind of businesses that are supposed to be operating in those particular areas. So that is what this city master plan stipulates. And as we speak today, we have, you know, uh, homes or areas which are usually homes and people are using them for purposes of, you know, offices or for purposes of, uh, you know, hotels or something like that. And this is what the city wants uh, to read out. And they're saying three months should be enough for people to relocate to the commercial buildings. But Sharon, the challenge here 
is the cost of space at this commercial building. This is why most people have resorted to having their homes or some of these homes as their offices, because rent has been very exorbitant. And so most of them have resorted to using these spaces from their homes where they can be able to sleep and still be able to operate their offices uh, on a day, day-to-day basis. Um, so this is what the situation is as we speak today based on the master plan and its implementation, Sharon. Right, Eugene. And one would wonder, what of those uh, tenants perhaps who have uh, paid, uh, you know, in advance of more than the three months' notice that they have been given, is there any particular arrangements that have been made for such cases? Right. This time around, the city has been very lenient. It's unlike uh, the billboards, which we spoke of a few weeks ago, which were ordered to be removed immediately. This time around, the city says, you know, if you had signed a deal that is more than three months, then they will be looking into this and seeing how much more time you will be needing to be able to move out of that particular place. But of course, there are, uh, you know, unscrupulous people who might come and say, um, I have more than uh, three months at this particular place that I'm in. So the city says that they have devised a mechanism to, you know, investigate properly to ensure that they really find out whether it is true that your lease is more than three months or less than that. But anything other than more than three months for those who have no genuine uh, documentation to show that they have more months at those places will be ordered to close down. Right, Eugene. And other than this city plan, perhaps you can speak to us about other news making headlines in Rwanda in this new year. Right, Sharon. The year is, uh, you know, Kigali still a bit laid back. Um, most people still getting back to work, of course. Um, I, but but what's, what's important, which a new development, development that we'll be looking into in the coming days is the decision by a U.S. court that um, uh, the last king of Rwanda should be buried here in Rwanda. They, there was a sort of a tussle on where uh, the king, uh, the last king of Rwanda should be buried. He died in the U.S. and, um, you know, up to today he has not been buried and the U.S. court has actually ordered that uh, his remains be brought and he should be buried here in Rwanda, a place called Nyanza, where he was born. And so there is anticipation, anticipation that, um, you know, this is one of the news stories that will be developing, especially when the body returns, the organization of the funeral, uh, the involvement of the government uh, in this particular burial process. Um, and, you know, this, this is a person who was a key figure, key historical figure, for Rwanda, uh, when during the days when the Rwanda, when, when the country uh, had a monarch, and so uh, Sharon, this is a story that I'm definitely going to be putting my ears on the ground to follow up on, and I'll be reporting on it as days go by. All right, many thanks, Eugene, and indeed a very happy New Year to you from that side of the region. Thank you for the updates from Rwanda. Of course, Eugene, they're just talking to, about, to us about that city plan aimed at relocating uh, people who are operating their offices from homes to places that are designated to have commercial operating spaces. Let's move on now, and the first vice president of South Sudan, Taban Dengai, has urged citizens to support the transitional government government of national unity in order to bring a lasting peace in the country, addressing civilians upon ad arriving at the Freedom Square in Ye, southwest of the capital, Juba. Guy pleaded for reconciliation to stabilize the fragile country. This comes as the government prepares to send to Ethiopia a mobilization team tasked to advance a recent national dialogue message to rebel-held territories. A leaked text shows the primary goal of South Sudanese President Salva Kiir and first Vice President Taban Dengai is to convince civilians who are in refugee camps, particularly those IDPs living in Ethiopian camps, at least 20 individuals are to be mobilized for that peace mission. <laughs> Entertainment. 
right and three persons, including two watchmen and a woman, were this week arrested in connection with New Year Day killing of Burundian Environment Minister Emmanuel Nyongkuru in the capital, Bujumbura. It was the first murder of a senior government figure in nearly two years of political violence. In July last year, the country's representative to the East African Legislative Assembly, Hafsa Morsi, was also killed in Bujumbura. Close to 500 people have died in clashes between protesters and security forces, while tit-for-tat killings continue after a 2015 failed coup, stalking fears of wider unrest in the country. The fate of peace talks between the government and opposition also remain in limbo following the declaration by the country's opposition to reject the ESC-appointed mediator, the former Tanzanian President Benjamin Mkapa. Violent protests erupted early in 2015 after President Pierre Nkurunziza said he would seek a third term, a move opponents said violated the constitution and a peace deal that ended an ethically charged civil war. Nkurunziza went on to win a re-election in July 2015 in a poll largely boycotted by the opposition. Now a court in Ethiopia has jailed a group of Muslims convicted of terrorism-related charges. Two journalists are among the 20 Muslims sentenced to prison on Tuesday. The group was first charged in 2014. In August 2015, a court sentenced 18 Muslims, including clerics and a journalist, to up to 22 years in prison under controversial anti-terrorism legislation. They were arrested three years ago of a protest against alleged government interference in religious affairs. Ethiopian government has often been accused of stifling dissent. It denies the allegation. Right, and on that point, we want to take a short break here on Bottom Line East Africa. Don't go too far. We have more news from across the East African region when we return, including a spotlight on the Kenyan political atmosphere. And I will be joined by a senior political affairs reporter, Duncan Hayemba, just to shed light and to just unpack exactly what is happening in Kenya on the same. Don't go too far.